to give us the opening remarks as we start the webinar. Dr. Reno, over to you. Thank you very much, Elida. Uh, I'm not going to take very much of your time uh, this morning because uh, you're not here to listen to us, you're only here to listen to the uh, various team members. Uh, just want to recall that about eight years ago, <clears throat> IDRC and QLTF decided to join together uh, to develop the QLTF program, the, a program to support the development and adoption of new innovations and technologies to improve food and insurance food security in East and Southern Africa. Special attention was uh, provided to gender and to, to sustainability as key element of that program. Over the past few months, uh, the work which is funded by QLTF and the context in which we operate uh, have been strongly affected by the COVID. For most people, COVID-19 is a health problem, a health issue, but we all know that confinement measures that have been implemented to control the spread of the disease also had a significant impact on food system around the world by restricting uh, food move, the movement of food and people within and across national boundaries. So it has impacted on the production, the transport, the storage, processing, commercialization of food, and had a major effect on the capacity of the most vulnerable to access the food that was available uh, due to a loss of daily income. But the confinement associated to COVID-19 also had serious impacts on the capacity of the research project that had been supported by IDRC and ACAR to actually implement their planned activities. Field work had to be brought to a stop, training had to be cancelled, meeting had to be cancelled, and all QLTF team had been forced to reconsider the way they operate to adjust to this new context. Several of the team have also decided to revise their activities to find ways to contribute to the response, which is being implemented by uh, various government uh, to uh, the food crisis associated to COVID. So, given IDRC's and ACR interest for learning and for adaptive management, it seems to be important to us to better document and capture the richness of the experience and the work that the team involved in QLTF are doing and how they're adjusting to the crisis. So today's webinar is an opportunity for the various team to exchange on their own experience and to learn from one another, but it's also an experience for IDRC to learn from the experience of the various team and to find how we can also give greater visibility to the robustness and the excellence of the work which is being done by the various team members. So, I will not uh, take more of your time. I'll pass the mic to Anna, my colleague in uh, ACR, which is co-managing ACR with me. But I just wanted to wish you all a uh, very welcome uh, for this morning, afternoon, evening, depending on who is on the, on the line, and to uh, say how thrilled I am to uh, be able to engage more. Uh, in knowing how the team have been impacted by the COVID, but essentially how they've been trying to readjust their activities uh, to actually face the new context. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Anna Rochello, and I manage the Livestock Systems Research Program at ACR, based in Canberra. Um, I haven't met many of you. I've met some of you. Um, I've talked to, to some of you. Um, but I just would really like to introduce myself and, and some of our team from Canberra that are also sitting in on this meeting. Um, I've taken over, I guess, from Melissa Wood's position, who's, who's left ACR. I know a lot of you worked very closely with her and know her, um, so I don't proclaim to stand in Melissa's shoes, but I'm the focal point now for, for Colty Up2 on the ACR side. So. Much of what Renault said, absolutely, I echo that. I'm very excited to hear more about uh, these projects and, and hear about what you guys have been doing. Uh, but also from the COVID-19 perspective, a lot of what Renault has just said and, and the purpose of this meeting is really to um, see, see how we can adapt. And it's certainly something that ACR is looking at across all our research portfolios. So, so this meeting is very interesting for us from that perspective as well. So thank you all for your time today, and I really look forward to the conversations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renaud and Anna. We appreciate those words. Now we're going to go to have the first speaker. 
So our first presenter is from the pre-cooked pins, Ms. Grace Nanyonjo, who is a social economist and gender specialist working at uh, the National Crops Resource Research Institute in Naro in Uganda. Grace, please. Uh, thank you so much, Edida. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nanyonjo Grace. Uh, presenting on behalf of the Precooked Beans Project. Uh, this project is implemented in Uganda and Kenya, where beans are a major source of protein, source of, uh, source of food, source of income, and so many other nutrients. So therefore, to increase consumption of beans in these two countries, the Precooked Beans Project came up with the innovation to increase bean, uh, to increase bean consumption through reducing the cooking time. And as a result, a bean snack, a bean flour, and then the Precooked Bean product itself that cooks in just 15 minutes were devolved. Therefore, phase two of this project announces this impact to scale up supply and utilization of Precooked Bean products to improve food and nutrition security, improve incomes, environmental conservation, while leveraging on public-private partnership. To date, the project has registered um, over 10,000 women and, se and 7,000 men on MasterCard Pharma Network, which is a digital payment method, to increase women control over income by sending money from bean sales directly to their phones, which gives, them, which gives them a sense of ownership and increases their agents to use this money and also to create more opportunities for them to be able to access credit through automated transactions. The project has also created more opportunities for female entrepreneurs to participate in this scalar process of pre-cooked beans. And to date, we have Smart Logistics, based in Nairobi, and then Eastern African Development Company Limited, based in Uganda. Uh, amid this progress, uh, COVID-19 has impacted on so many activities, including but not limited to training of men and women farmers in good agronomic practices for improved grain quality, which grain is used for processing pre-cooked beans, and also training of farmers on use of this MasterCard platform to increase its adoption. With this not happening, there's a likelihood that productivity will be affected, which also has a direct impact on food and nutrition security, and also supply of grain as raw materials for pre-cooking the beans. And just to this new context, the project has made available improved quality seeds and made it accessible to men and women farmers on credit. That means the issue of access with restrictions movement and then the issue of affordability at a time of competing needs and priorities are really catered for. The project is also engaging more, more partners as processors to participate in large scale production of pre cooked beans to increase bean consumption in this situation as a cheap source of protein and other nutrients. Where in a situation where men and women have no source of income to afford cooking fuel, if or even to afford other protein sources. So at this point, pre-cooked beans, it is a viable option to ensure food and nutrition security, in, not only in Uganda and Kenya, but even in other countries, this can be done. Um, the project, during this, during this process, we've learned that gender inequalities are really increasing and the gap still exists. And in this period, women farmers have been impacted on heavily. And there's a likelihood that the gender yield gap will increase. For example, for one to access seed in a situation of restricted movements, no public transport, no private transport, one must walk to the market or to an agro dealer to access seed, which is so hard for our women who are already constrained by the reproductive roles of caring for their family, uh, cooking food, caring for the sick, for their children, and so many other things. Secondly, Women used to access credit through village savings and loans associations. Now with restrictions on uh, and the social uh, distancing rule, that cannot happen. Thirdly, with commercialization of beans, men used to depend more on hired labor. Now with restriction movement, hand labor is no longer available. That means men have resorted to using family labor. These are women and children. This means that women will not have enough time to manage their own bean plots leading to productivity. Therefore, COVID-19 crisis is an awakening call to all donors out, outside there, all implementing partners that we really need to double our efforts towards closing the gender, 
towards closing the gender inequality gap if we really want to achieve good inputs. Thank you so much to IDRC and Asia for your dedicated effort towards closing the gender inequality gap. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chris. So that was from the pre-cooked pins. I want to take the opportunity to welcome Dr. Levison Chihuahua. He's an associate professor of economics in the head of department of economics in the University of Malawi. Dr. Levison, over to you. Thank you all. Um, good morning, good afternoon. Um, presenting, representing the Amarian team, and our project is titled Gender Inclusive Financing for Scaling Up Improved Fish Processing Technologies in Malawi. Uh, this project uh, emerged after we noted that fish is very important, uh, not only in Malawi, but in many African communities. Particularly in Malawi, it is important in terms of uh, uh, animal protein because over half of the animal protein comes from fish in Malawi and it also employs a lot of people uh, in Malawi. So along the fish value chain, we have a lot of people who are participating as fishers, processors and the different activities. Uh, however, despite these um, importances, we also noted that we lose a lot of fish uh, along the value chain. Uh, current estimates uh, show that up to Three of the 10 fish that is caught from the lake are lost due to poor processing technologies. So we came up with uh, two technologies, the improved fish processing technology, as well as the uh, sorting dryer to resolve uh, these uh, post-harvest loss uh, challenges. We tested these and found them to be effective, environmentally friendly, uh, in, as well as economically viable. However, uh, scaling was challenged by low uh, capacity to uh, construct uh, these because of financing challenges. So a lot of fish processors could not adopt these technologies because they couldn't finance the adoption. So in this uh, project, what we are doing, we are uh, implementing a scaling strategy at the center of which there is a financing, uh, uh, a financing product which we have developed. This financing product we have developed together with a, a, a commercial bank, FDH bank. We specifically uh, worked with a commercial bank because these communities are excluded, they are financially excluded. Banks look at them as high risk uh, communities. So we went to the bank to come up with a, a financing product that would be specifically uh, suitable for these communities. So they, uh, as of now, we have come up with with this product, the financing product or a loan facility. What this loan facility, uh, uh, the characteristics is that it recognizes uh, the unique features of the fishing community. Uh, we are uh, giving uh, uh, lower interest rates. They, they are expected to pay lower interest rates. Uh, the fish processors are also, the banks also requires relatively low collateral from the uh, fish processors. And this is also uh, sensitive to women. Uh, because we are giving uh, women a lower interest rate, as well as uh, the project is encouraging potential women to apply for the loans. So as of now, we have about uh, 60 applicants to the loan, uh, which is uh, being uh, processed by the commercial bank. Uh, 25 of these are women, which is uh, really uh, good considering that normally women are left out. An additional thing we have uh, achieved as of now is that we have developed a uh, dry fish standard for Malawi. Presently, our Bureau of Standards uh, uses a regional standard, that is the Sadiki region uh, standard for dry fish. And this leaves a lot of gaps uh, in terms of uh, regulating fish quality, dry fish quality. So we have developed this uh, standard and it's submitted to the Malawi Bureau of Standards. It is just awaiting the a technical committee of the Malawi Bureau of Standards to meet and approve the standard. When they approve this, this will be very important because one, it means Malawi will have our own uh, standard. Secondly, uh, the fish that is coming from certain dryers and the uh, improved smoking kings will be uh, safeguarded or protected by the uh, quality regulators. Then in terms of COVID, we uh, have also been affected most, mostly because of the limitations in the movements as well as gathering uh, of people. Uh, in this way, we are unable to uh, implement our activities 
to promote the financing uh, uh, strategy, as well as uh, promoting agenda because we are also empowering women in our uh, project. Uh, as a way forward, we still, uh, for example, uh, promote the, uh, the financing product through telephone calls, we call the individuals. We also uh, engage uh, in small meeting uh, trainings, so we, we small group trainings to enable us to uh, reach out to the people. That's why we have uh, 60 applicants as of now. Uh, we are also considering that this is the uh, a sector that is left out with COVID response. We are also supplying our uh, COVID uh, uh, safety materials. Thank you for uh, uh, listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Chihuahua. I would like to invite the third presenter from Insfit, Insects for Feed and um, for Animals, for Poultry and Feed. Uh, Dr. Crescenta Stanga is a research scientist at the International Center of Insect Physiology and Ecology. He's a project PI. Dr. Tanga, over to you. Um, thank you very much, um, Edida. I will be presenting on behalf of the team, the Insect for, Insect for Food, uh, for Feed team. Um, and this was being carried out in Kenya and, um, and Uganda. And one of the key um, focus is on poultry, uh, fish and pig. Although these sectors have been known to be um, the fastest agri um, business uh, sectors, with women accounting for more than 60% of the entire population uh, involved in production, this sector is facing a lot of challenges, um, especially um, achieving its full potential. And this is because of the constraint they face um, with the major protein sources that accounts for um, 60 to 70% of the total cost of production, making this unaffordable for our poor um, uh, smallholder farmers and as such there's a dying consequences of this on the vulnerable population uh, which are mostly the women and the youths but uh, with the InSpeed 2 project we have good news for everyone insects have been found to be, uh, to, to, to be more cost effective and they're promising and they're alternative uh, source of protein that can replace the fish uh, meal that has been widely um, um, used and the most important thing that we just came uh, realize in our project is that um, the insects, when you replace fish meal by just 15%, you are able to create uh, more than 14,000 jobs in a year. And in terms of recycling waste or waste mitigation, we are we'll be recycling or removing waste of about 275,000 metric tons, which is equivalent to the amount of waste that you, you, is produced in Nairobi in a year. And it's also important to note that when you replace the fish meal with insects, because they are very rich in uh, fat and protein, you are also re removing fish and maize, which can be used for human consumption. And our study shows that it can go up to uh, 1.3 million metric tons of maize that can be freed for human consumption. And the most interesting part on this study is that the waste residues that is left behind after running the insect can be used as a high quality organic fertilizer. And we've realized that with 15% replacement, you can have more than 11,000 metric tons of waste. So you can clearly see that in our project, when you recycle waste, which is unsuitable for uh, direct human consumption into high quality protein for animal feed and also uh, organic fertilizer, we are our project is um, making, a, it's a trending project, project because it's a whole holistic package of what you call circular economy. So the interesting part here is that when the biofertilizer is being transformed and tested on farm, on maize, on fresh beans, on tomatoes, on kales, our results, our scale with about five to 10 percent, that of most commercial products in the market, uh, commercial fertilizer in the market, uh, and Synergy right now is already engaging in using our, our product for um, uh, advancement to scale that out to its farmers. But the sad news here is that when we introduce the ProWaya um, package um, to evaluate uh, women empowerment, we realize that women, especially wives, were highly disadvantaged uh, compared to um, the women um, uh, headed households or men headed households. And so, because these wives are highly disadvantaged, this is now has guided our choice of selection of farmers or encouraging those that can engage in capacity building as a way of scaling up um, this project. Um, but with the uh, avenue of um, um, uh, COVID-19, 
This has severely impacted on the project in several ways. The first is that it has significantly reduced movements um, from one project site to another, given that we walk across from West Af um, Western Kenya to um, Central Kenya, and so there's a lot of restricted movements. The second thing is that most of the waste companies that have been supplying our smallholder farmers um, to produce these insects to meet the volume required by the feed millers are already out of stock because they can't produce the amount of volume anymore because most of these uh, waste produce production companies have shut down. And as such, um, what we have done now is to recruit personnel on site, on project site to carry out our activities. And the next uh, part is that we are also trying to get a community dryer to help facilitate activities of these farmers. But most importantly, what we have learned in the course of this COVID-19 is that being flexibility, flexibility in research and development, we can completely maintain productivity with lesser impact on the project. I would like to thank IDRC and ACR for such a great opportunity of this project and giving us a face of circular economy in, the, in motion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanga. The next project is the Youth Agripreneurs. Uh, our presenter is Ms. Salome Asena. She's a, research, a senior research officer at the School of Graduate Studies, Research and Extension at the United States International University in Africa. She's the project manager to this culture project. Salome, over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, all protocols observed, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Salome Asena, and I'll be sharing with you about an exciting project called the DAB, the Metro Agri-Food Living Lab model. Um, did you know that 800,000 young Kenyans join the labor market every year? Statistics also show that 80% of the, those who are unemployed in Kenya are below 35 years of age. Well, this calls for uh, the private sector, government, and institutions of higher learning to come up with innovative business models, to also come up with a good curricula that will change the mindsets of not only being employed, but to be employers, and the government sharing with us enabling policies that can support such initiatives. Well, the Metro Agri-Food Living Lab model is one such model that has assesses the impact of training, access to finance, and mentorship. This calls for, uh, this has been piloted in phase one with uh, targeting uh, 60, that's 30 men and women, and it's currently being upscaled, targeting 300 young Kenyans aged between 18 and 35, cutting across nine county Kenyan government systems. Well, uh, before COVID-19, we were able to assess uh, the verify business, the 309 uh, businesses. We were also able to conduct training and we were also able to conduct, uh, uh, mid, collect midline data, assess the impact of training. The team was also well prepared because we had selected uh, the mentees and the mentors. After COVID or during COVID, the government uh, raised a cessation of movement. This therefore meant that the project team need to go back to the drawing board. The team administered a midterm survey to conduct, to find out the feasibility of the mentorship. 100% uh, of the mentors were on board with conducting virtual mentorship. This meant that we could reach out to the entrepreneurs through phones, phone calls, SMS, WhatsApp messages, Zoom videos, you name it. While for the mentees, 94% were on board with the same, same similar uh, comments uh, or survey results such as the mentors. The 16th, the 6, the 6 who are not on board were uh, scared because of uh, intellectual property rights of their businesses and a lack of phone network. This meant that the USIU Africa Management Board uh, had to think quick and fast. They signed up an agreement with Safaricom PLC and Telcom Kenya to be able to provide subsidized internet services for our mentors and mentees to be able to interact even during this COVID-19. The in the same university, we have an agribusiness center that has been hosting agribusiness webinars to be able to, to, be able to share uh, uh, exciting uh, skills and knowledge with different speakers and with different entrepreneurs from not only in Kenya, but outside the country. 
After we started a virtual mentorship, entrepreneurs such as Sarah Achieng, who is a silkworm farmer in Kisumu County, was able to be reached, to be talked to, and also to understand the gaps that she's currently facing. This therefore meant that instead of working on the business plan that we had initially thought of, the first thing that we will have to work with the entrepreneurs is to create a recovery plan to be able to find out how we can help the entrepreneurs who are currently not able to move from one country, one county to another, how they are handling health systems in their businesses, just to mention but a few. The uh, entrepreneurs, the mentor, virtual mentorship began in May and will continue till uh, July for three months. The team has also collected, um, is currently collecting data to find out how the entrepreneurs are actually coping with COVID-19. The team is also able to assess business resilience from the time the project started till now. This therefore means that the model will not only be able to create job opportunities, but also maintain agri-food systems, as well as build uh, entrepreneurs who are resilient, not only during COVID-19, but also to other pandemics such as floods and uh, locusts which have been in the past here in Kenya. I'd like to thank IDRC and ASIA for the support in, uh, in maintaining and also helping us in our project. My colleague, Professor Amos Njuguna and Francis Wambalaba are also online to, to be able to answer any other questions that you might be having. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much, Salome, and thank you for all the team, all the teams that presented. So this is a, these were the rollover projects, the scaling projects that I have completed now presenting. And we want to go into the, into the question and answer session before we take a, the short break. So I, I don't know, I'm going, to un, I'm going to invite you, Kennedy, to see if you have any questions. But I, as I mentioned before, that if you want to ask your question live, feel free to put up your hand. And then you can be picked to ask the question on a, on a, a first come first, uh, as many as are putting up their hands. Kennedy, over to you. Uh, thank you, Edida. Uh, thank you very much, our presenters. Wow, such a lovely presentation and timely. Now, for the Q&A, just like Edida mentioned, um, for those who want to shoot a question, please just click on the raising hands button. Once we see that, we'll give you the uh, opportunity to ask your question. I've checked through our chat box and so far I've not seen any question that has been raised, but please, if you have a question, just go on and uh, write it. Even if we go to the second session, we will still probably come and, uh, you know, say that question for the presenters to answer. So now let's see from the hands. Anyone who wants to shoot a live question, please raise your hand. Just to remind you, we had we have had four presenters, uh, the pre-cooked beans that was done by Grace, the fisheries in Malawi, Dr. Levison, Innsfree that was presentation done by Dr. Tanga, and lastly, Salome uh, for the youth agrapreneurs. So I'm checking through for those who want to shoot a question. Good, I've seen, yes. Good, let's start with uh, Francis Wambalaba, then followed by Eric Hartner from SCIR. Okay, uh, Francis Wambalaba from USIU Game Center. Uh, I'm just interested in, uh, from Dr. Levison in Malawi uh, about the interest rates that were provided by banks. I don't know what was the difference from the regular interest rates to what they were offering now. Uh, what was the difference? And maybe any other strategies of reaching out to maybe banks uh, to do something like that uh, in different locations, because that's something we are looking forward to in our financing. Uh, uh, well, when we get to the financing stage. Or, or maybe if lesson is away, I can I can attempt to answer. Okay. I'm Joseph, part of the team in Malawi. Uh, so I, I think the the normal. I would say the current uh, interest rate for all commercial banks in Malawi is about 23%. So uh, 
So our 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 negotiations with the bank currently is uh, at 19% uh, for for men, and the women will be paying 3% uh, lower, which be, which means I think they'll be paying around 16% uh, um, somehow. Uh, in terms of scaling, yes, I think uh, this is a process. What we intend to do is, after all this, we are going to scale out uh, to reach out to more commercial banks so that they they look at um, uh, natural resource based enterprises as also potential uh, for business in terms of the loan products, not only fisheries but any other natural resources. This will be a model for those kind of enterprises. Thank you. Levison, go ahead, please. Uh, okay. Yeah. So what what Joseph has said is correct. I just want also to say that um, going to other banks, what we have done is we are going to uh, there's a, uh, a financing project in Malawi, a large project. It's called Agricultural Commercialization. So we have also we have started talking to them, seeing for the possibility for them to provide a lot of uh, financing, which will be financed through the same bank. We are saying that implementing this project in the manner we are doing, the idea is to make sure that we show the bank that these people are bankable and they can repay the loans. So when the bank sees that it's working, they can scale out on their own, uh, thereby bringing in the private sector into uh, rural development. Thank you. Kenneth is muted, but I think there was Eric. Eric, your yes, hand yes, was sorry. up. Yes. Yeah, uh, greetings uh, from Australia, everyone. Um, I would just like to understand about the insect for feed uh, project, which sort of scale um, you have reached now, because the numbers you have quoted about the objective of processing 275,000 tons of waste or, or uh, recover 1.3 million tons of maize if uh, you get this replacement rate of 15% is really a, a very um, impressive objective to achieve. But um, we, which sort of roadmap do you have to get to that level? Where are we now and how are we going to get there? Um, thank you very much for that um, um, excellent question. And thanks also for following up our presentation. Um, right now we have um, um, one of our key objectives is to reach 11,000 farmers by the end of, end of the project. And so we are engaging um, um, different um, uh, business models, like uh, pulling together cooperatives, bringing together uh, feed millers who are producing the, their own insight and using it uh, for their own uh, production system. We are also having uh, areas of um, uh, having uh, um, SMEs, uh, production right now uh, within one and a half year of the project we have more than 37 medium scale producers and um, the biggest is producing um, close to three tons per day and uh, one one of the first contract with um, with uh, on feed to supply um uh, 40 tons of black soldier flies um, um, uh, per month uh, although on feed was asked for 500 metric tons to make sure that they shut down the use of uh, soya beans which is very difficult to to get as they are importing from um, neighboring countries, uh, countries, and sometimes even from South Africa, so we are we are doing all our best um, in all our six project sites. We are already establishing uh, pilot uh, production facilities and uh, making sure that this facility can produce uh, close to three to five tons of uh, insects per month. And with that, we expect um, a lot of farmers to continue um, production and uh, learning from this site. Um, I just got a question from uh, Dr. Tore, which um, she's asking what is most important. Um, I think the key thing is to make sure that we have production uh, 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 pilot facilities in each of the project sites. So in that case, we have already trained extension officer. We have trained um, community-led uh, farmers who can engage in training farmers within their communities and not allowing them to travel from uh, uh, Western Kenya to Nairobi for them to be trained. And as, as such, we think uh, with this uh, production facility closer to the farmers. And uh, we are also engaging with the county government, uh, especially with our youth groups. Um, USIU can testify that because we have youth groups uh, that are coming together and registering organizations that are producing the insects. And the um, county government is making every effort to assist in waste collection, sorting, and supplying this waste uh, to the youth groups. In that case, it, it's facilitating the, 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 the mass production of the insect, because one of the key elements there is uh, 
is the waste availability. Once the waste is available, product of the insert become um, um, uh, a, a very simple um, step to follow. So uh, I think, uh, and also with our very strong socioeconomic uh, team, we also have a gender orientation, which is also making sure that adoption and buy-in of this technology is highly engaged with, um, at, at county levels, as well as household levels, so, as, so that we, make sure, so we can make sure that we can reach out this number of farmers and to bring out our uh, model uh, system where you could have contract uh, farmers linking up with um, uh, potential medium scale producers so that they can supply the volume that is required by the feed millers and, and, and as, as well as all the big uh, um, players within this value chain. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tanga. Thank you very much, Tanga, for, for answering that question and thank you for picking it as well from our chat. Now, we have two more questions that were uh, delivered from our chat. One was from Elizabeth Muridi to the fisheries team in Malawi. Uh, she said, great to learn about the gender sensitive financing product with reduced interest rates and low collateral of all good women. Wondering its sustainability. So Levison and team, yeah. uh, if you would answer that. Hello, yeah. We think this is uh, uh, sustainable. Actually, our observation is that the fishing fishery sector or community, they are able to repay loans. The banks, when they came to this level, uh, it's a level they realize that they'll still be making a uh, profit. So, uh, if we, what, what would be more important as we'll be implementing this is for us to observe the fish processors repaying the loan. The moment they will be able to repay the loan and the bank will realize that they are still making profit out of this, then they will scale out to other uh, parts of Malawi without even us uh, uh, encouraging them to do that, because they'll see the business sense out of this. So the idea is to make the bank see uh, it for themselves, but because they, they were scared, what the project has done is to bring the bank to this uh, scary uh, society, uh, provide them with some uh, confidence that these people will pay back the loan, but when the people pay back their loan, we, we expect this to take itself uh, forward. Thank you. Thank you, Levison, for the answer. We also have another question to Salome and team on the youth agripreneurs. The question reads from Jemima, with the data from phase one, where the mentoring was one-on-one -on -one with business counselors, will you be able to make a comparative analysis of the effectiveness of online mentoring vis-a-vis one-on-one mentoring? Over to Salome and team comparative analysis um thank you so much jemima for your question it will actually be good to uh, make a comparative study because uh, in the, uh, the first phase we had uh, this space uh, online uh, mentorship while uh, this space will have uh, uh will have online sorry the, the first phase we had face to face the second is had online i'll also request uh, profound balaba to add on that as well uh, yes, thank you uh, for the question. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, actually worked well in our favor is that uh, the mentorship uh, process just began after we had collected uh, the midline data. And because of that, we started now to collect data. We are collecting actually continuous data, and that will give us uh, an indication on actually the impact of COVID and also uh, on the way the mentorship online is actually uh, working because there are diaries that uh, both the mentees and the mentors are taking. And we believe that that kind of information will give us a feel of how different uh, the face-to-face -face activity and the online uh, activity is because as my colleague mentioned we want to also measure the resilience of these uh, businesses during any kind of calamities that come along and we want to use the mentorship as a way of doing that as well i'm looking at yeah we have one question uh please be right are okay That's go ahead and one. shoot your question Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I just I would like to know what kind of scalable technologies are they using in the insect and fish production? Is it something uh, you know at the middle scale level or something at farm level? 
that is what I want to move into. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, we, we are we are we are targeting all these different modular uh, systems. As I earlier said, we are doing on farm level, which means um, you have farmers producing the insects and uh, and using it directly um, to feed their livestock. It could, be, it could be poultry or give it to their fish, as well as uh, give it to uh, give it to, to to their pigs. We also have the other component, which is um, um, uh, medium scale, small to medium scale, where you find. And uh, some of these young young um, entrepreneurs, uh, as I said, producing between 0 0.3 um, tons to three tons per day, uh, where they are producing and drying and uh, putting pulling resources together to make sure they can supply to some of the feed millers around. And uh, then we also have the other component where we're working very closely with uh, Synergy, which is a much more bigger player um, within within the the production system. But what we are we are working a lot more towards is to make sure that um, they change their waste stream. To, to more of uh, the, not not the, the, the human physics um, waste stream because there's a lot of potential for them to sell their product, but there's this handicap. So we are testing all the all the different models, uh, possible models, up, all together with cooperative models, even feed millers producing their own black soldier flies. We are assisting them so that they don't have to spend any uh, um, money going to buy from uh, other farmers, but they can get from other farmers as as an addition to what they have. So we have a lot of uh, model, uh, different models that we are testing to make sure that. Uh, we can come out with a, a very a more proper business case um, for the for, uh, for this value chain because one of the uh, things we are uh, trying to make sure is to make sure we have a very viable and sustainable uh, value chain which uh, doesn't exist. So we are building up on building up on this, and we don't want to leave out any gaps. Uh, and uh, Professor Dorothy is around. I think she can she can add if she if she <laughs> or, 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 or Dr. Monica you can add. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Tanga, and thank you so much, Kennedy, for that. We, I suggest that we would we will stop here and take the five minute break. In five minutes, just five minutes, Dr. Lea Andungu will take us on on the next session. We are ready to start the second session of uh, the wow. webinar. So, hello everyone. My name is Lea Andungu. I am the regional manager of ACS program in Eastern and Southern Africa. And it's really great to welcome you to this second session of our CAUTF uh, webinar. So I just allow me to do something because I noticed that uh, the ACS CEO quietly got into the meeting somewhere in the, during the first session. I would like to introduce uh, Professor Andrew Campbell, who is uh, ACS CEO, uh, and I would like him to just say something small. Uh, just greet, greet us, uh, Andrew, before we get into session two. Thank you. Thank you, Leia. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. I've been here since the start and it's been wonderful hearing from all the project leaders and uh, I look forward to hearing more about the wonderful work happening through COLTF. Great to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and welcome to uh, COLTF. So I met many of you during the training of gender and communications training last year when we in May. And so it's really great to connect. Welcome to the second session. So what we are going to focus on, as you know from your timetable, is that we will do the five new projects, what we call new projects, the five projects that started in the second phase of CAUTF. And to start us off is uh, Dr. Dorothy Nakimbugwe, to present to us on the NutriFish project. Dorothy is the core PI uh, of this project and is director of the Nutrial Limited. Over to you, Dorothy. Thank you very much and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dorothy Nachimbugwe, uh, presenting updates for the NutriFish project. NutriFish is harnessing the dietary nutrients uh, of underutilized fish, and these include the really small fishes that are less than 20 centimeters in length, as well as the byproducts of uh, the fish filleting industry. Uh, to reduce micronutrient deficiencies among vulnerable individuals. Women of reproductive age and children aged less than five years are really vulnerable to malnutrition because they have high nutrient requirements. However, in our developing countries, their diets are always uh, usually deficient in uh, uh, animal source foods, which are good sources of nutrients like 
micronutrients. Um, right now, as we speak, there is a woman somewhere in a Ugandan uh, community. She has a sick child, and that child probably has micronutrient deficiencies. She hasn't been able to get to the health center for the past five weeks because of COVID-19 lockdown restrictions. However, um, fortunately, uh, uh, NutriFish Project uh, is um, uh, working on uh, um, alleviating that situation. Um, two of our key um, uh, results from this period is that we were able to develop a food product uh, that uh, incorporates uh, small fishes and is nutrient dense. Uh, a single serving of that uh, a meal from that product, it's a maize enriched product that uh, uh, is enriched with, uh, uh, with silver fish. And a serving of that meal provides between 30 uh, to 50% of the daily requirement of key, uh, of five key nutrients. That is protein, energy, vitamin A, iron and zinc. And um, uh, however, we also we have been affected by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. We should be uh, out in the communities. Uh, um, sorry. So the NutriFish project uh, you, intends to use these underutilized fish. The fishes are underutilized because, for instance, uh, only 40% of the silver fish that is harvested in Uganda goes into human food. The other 60% goes into animal feed because it is poor quality due to poor uh, post-harvest handling methods. Um, one of our key uh, results from this uh, period is to develop a nutrient enhanced food that when this mother goes to the health center, not only does she receive the medical treatment but she can also take a product that is enriched that she and her children can eat and prevent malnutrition. Um, however, some of our activities have been affected. So for instance, while uh, nine, over 90% of the labor force that is involved in post-harvest processing of fish is provided by women, our uh, baseline studies, including the PROWARE, which uh, uh, gives an, an index of women empowerment, revealed that up to 64% of the women in the communities that were surveyed are, um, um, uh, are disempowered. And much of the disempowerment is coming from uh, a, wa a high workload burden. The NutriFish project also intends to, pro uh, to introduce technologies, uh, improved technologies for handling of the fish, for instance, solar tent dryers, which will reduce drudgery, uh, improve the quality and quantity of the fish that, that is available, and ultimately translate into uh, improved incomes. However, the COVID pandemic affected our activities, uh, including the setting up of those technologies. Nevertheless, the project adapted and were able to fast track the development of that nutrient enhanced food and two and a half uh, tons of it were donated to a health center uh, at the referral hospital in Kampala and will be used to demonstrate the benefits of uh, uh, complementary feeding as a means of preventing malnutrition rather than treating it. Uh, the second uh, intervention that we made is that we responded to a call by Makere University uh, for proposals that respond and alleviate the impacts of COVID-19. Uh, two such proposals were presented, one to scale up that feeding study and another one to assess the impact of COVID on uh, fish value chains. The findings from those proposals will be important for informing and influencing policy towards making value, the fish value chains more resilient, but also to taking a preventive approach to uh, handling malnutrition rather than the uh, therapeutic that is currently prevalent. Um, in this process, our key learning was a need to adapt to situations and use available resources and technologies and platforms to be able to uh, continue with project implementation. We are very thankful to IDRC and ASIA for giving us the opportunity uh, to be able to do that. And thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Dorothy, for your presentation on Nutrifish. Uh, we will reserve the questions to the end, as we did in session one. And so right away, allow me to uh, welcome the next presenter, uh, who is uh, presenting on the FASIMO, uh, from the FASIMO team in Mozambique. So this is uh, Dr. Mario Chiludo. So Dr. Mario, uh, welcome. Okay, uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, well, my name is Mario Shilundo and uh, I'll be presenting about our project, which is uh, <clears throat> farmer-led smallholder irrigation in Mozambique. Uh, well, we intend with our project uh, to increase um, productivity of smallholder farmers and of course with a close eye on sustainability of our interventions. Um, we have a focus, I mean, our project is about supporting uh, the farmers uh, to make them more profitable. Uh, why we, are we doing that? Uh, basically, it's because irrigation uh, it's seen as a key uh, sector at the moment because we have uh, about 90% of our smallholder farmers uh, relying on rain-fed uh, agriculture, which of course uh, has a lot of limitations, especially posed by the climate change and variability. Therefore, irrigation again is, is a key aspect to, to be considered. Uh, so what have we achieved so far in the project? Uh, we managed at the moment to engage three, uh, uh, I mean farmers from three uh, schemes. 38% of those are women. Uh, we also, as part of uh, finding the entry points of the project, uh, we undertake it, uh, we have undertaken a situation, a participatory situation analysis. Uh, and from that, we could learn that uh, agronomic practice and skills, also coupled with the uh, market uh, linkages, were found to be the major issues uh, limiting uh, the productivity and, uh, and also income of these farmers. Uh, also, one key aspect that we could uh, find out of this exercise is that uh, water scarcity, of course, it's a very limiting factor especially during the dry season. Um, therefore, we started with the training of government extension officers, uh, and, and these extension officers, they will be assisting the farmers first, and also in, uh, uh, connected to us as a, as a FASIMO project, and in installing and monitoring uh, moisture and the nutrient tools. Uh, what we want there, of course, is to improve how the water it ma is managed right there at the plot a level and see how we can reduce the amount of water that is being used by these farmers. Uh, however, when we are finalizing this activity, we are also hit by the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which of course has affected tremendously the project, especially because of limitation in terms of movement. Uh, FASIMO relies a lot on the participatory action research approaches, uh, which require, of course, the P2P interactions uh, with the farmers. Uh, and therefore, we had to suspend our, uh, our field activities and focus more into planning and the analyzing data at the office. We also could learn from remote uh, communication with the farmers that uh, also they have been impacted in terms of reduction of their purchasing capacity. I mean, their financial uh, has been affected, especially to purchase input. And also the buyers that used to go to these farms to purchase, I mean, their products, they were now forced, you know, to, 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 to uh, they were not able uh, to reach the farmers. And then the farmers, I mean, uh, they had a situation of unsold uh, pro uh, products uh, that they could not put them on the market. So to respond to this, we move on to uh, strategies that we could use uh, to, to sort of uh, support the farmers. Uh, the first one that uh, we are considering is to the provision of input in form of credit and saving schemes. The idea there is to sort of provide uh, the input to these farmers, then of course monitor uh, the income and the, the, the income that will be generated from these uh, uh, um, uh, uh, inputs. Then they can be used as a safety net in pre periods of crisis. We are also uh, considering to pilot a uh, phone-based electronic uh, platform through SMSs and, and videos that, of course, can provide 
training and technical assistance to the farmers remotely. And also coupled to that, we have the linkages uh, between the farmers and the market and also with input provided through these platforms. Uh, we learn uh, out of these exercises, access is extremely important uh, to engage, identify and train local uh, project champions that can help us uh, to uh, assist the farmers while we are also doing this uh, remotely. And uh, let me also thank uh, this point IDRC and ICR for uh, the support and uh, also uh, state that, you know, without food, uh, there's no way we can uh, uh, survive all this COVID situation. So we uh, please urge uh, IDRC and ASIA to keep on uh, financing uh, Fazimo. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mario, uh, project leader of our irrigation project in Mozambique. Thank you. So uh, let's move on now to the SOGAM project in Ethiopia, which is led by uh, Dr. Mekonen Sime. Uh, he is the national team coordinator for the CAUTF2 activities in Ethiopia. Over to you, Dr. Mekonen. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mekonen Sime from Ethiopia. I'll be presenting on sorghum pillow project entitled uh, Smart Intervention for Smallholder Farmers uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, as to the background of the project, sorghum is uh, grown widely in the country. Uh, over 1.1 million hectares of land is covered by sorghum. It is a certain important crop next to maize and teff uh, in terms of area and the volume of production. Uh, sorghum grain is mainly used for uh, human consumption, while the stover is uh, used as animal feed, fuel, and uh, construction materials. It has also the potential to be uh, feed for uh, chicken in the growing poultry industry. Uh, sorghum uh, being a very drought tolerant crop, uh, it has a, a potential of, uh, a, a max, to produce maximum biomass uh, is given volume of uh, water. And the country has got a huge potential to produce sorghum to uh, feed the population of the country. Uh, in recent years, the demand for uh, injera, which is a fermented bread, uh, flat bread made from uh, sorghum and teff, uh, is increasing due to the soaring price of teff, uh, which is the staple food crop in the country. In general, sorghum plays a key role to meet the increasing uh, cereal demand. However, its production and the productivity is uh, constrained by uh, one, low access to improved varieties, uh, such as adaptive to the harsh environment and the management options, uh, climate uh, change re uh, related uh, constraints, constraints are also affecting the production and the productivity, especially droughts, and availability of post-harvest technologies such as uh, threshing, uh, uh, post, uh, post storage facilities and the dehaling uh, technologies are uh, not available. Uh, knowledge gap is also prevailing on sorghum food and the feed value chain, uh, uh, as well as there is a limited access to input and output markets of the uh, commodity. Hence, this project is trying to uh, develop and deploy key technologies that reduce uh, uh, risk of crop failure, increase productivity, uh, and create new economic opportunities for the commodity. Uh, since the uh, launching of the project, uh, that means April 2019, uh, we have undertaken several activities. To mention some of one, uh, one is we undertook uh, demonstration of improved varieties that is adapted to uh, droughts areas, uh, which is called RGT variety, with uh, its management practice. And uh, to evaluate the performance of uh, this variety, we organized three field days where uh, 378 farmers, out of which 25% are women, has participated in the evaluation process. Uh, second, uh, sorghum threshing being the uh, labor demanding activity, especially for uh, women and uh, children labor. 
uh, we tried to demonstrate and evaluate three uh, engine-driven uh, threshold technologies uh, uh, so that farmers can uh, evaluate and uh, understand the performance of the technology. In this, we tried to uh, involve 935 farmers and the development workers, of which 28% of movement uh, on the evaluation and the, uh, on the evaluation of the performance of the technology, and based on the feedback we collected from the uh, demonstration and evaluation, one uh, treasure which was uh, multi-crop treasure uh, was selected for further improvement and a promotion. Thirdly, we tried to develop a protocol, two protocols for. Uh, uh, quality in making from sorghum, uh, uh, from uh, sorghum floor and uh, teeth, as well as also uh, preparation of chicken feed uh, ration from sorghum and other ingredients. These are some of the uh, achievements uh, uh, we have uh, made. Uh, with regard to the impact of COVID, uh, actually there is a huge impact on health and economic aspects, but with regard to culture uh, project activities, uh, so far, most of the activities are running uh, very well as per the plan. However, uh, it has affected uh, the, uh, to undertake baseline survey, uh, value chain analysis, and organization of some trainings. And also some visits from UQ or SER staff has been postponed due to the, due to the lockdown uh, as a result of the pandemic. The adjustments we made so far, where we tried to reach farmers, development workers, and uh, extension experts uh, uh, through phone calls uh, and the preparation and the distribution of practical guidelines so that the activities will run as per the, uh, uh, the desired plan. Uh, we are also forced to suspend uh, the trainings and the baseline service uh, as a result of uh, this uh, pandemic. And uh, the lesson so far we uh, learned from uh, the pandemic, uh, business can't continue as usual, so we need to uh, look for uh, proactive measures to adapt to the situation. With this, I would like to uh, end my presentation. And I would like to thank IDRC and ACR for supporting the project. Uh, maybe Taye and Bisrat will uh, join me during the question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McConnell, uh, together with your team. So we'll move on to yes. the next presentation. So the next presentation is on uh, the picture-based insurance project. And this is at the uh, by the, uh, it's going to be led by engineer Amos Tabalia, who is the project PI, but also uh, an agri-climate data analyst, analyst at uh, the Agriculture and Climate Risk Enterprise Limited, which is Acre Africa, Kenya. Over to you, Amos. Thank you, Leah, and uh, thank you uh, all of uh, you for giving me this chance to uh, share this exciting project that uh, we are carrying out. Uh, I'm really excited to just share the progress of our project. Um, uh, first of all, um, there's a question, and the question is, how do you leverage the existing uh, uh, digital technologies to improve productivity and resilience of smallholder farmers? This is exactly what our project intends to do and what it has been doing since uh, last year, April. Uh, our project is uh, uh, designing and developing a suite of uh, picture-based insurance solutions, which can be remotely advocated and uh, provided to smallholder farmers. Uh, so far, our key significant um, achievements have actually been uh, around developing these uh, suite of, uh, of solutions. So we have managed to develop a picture-based uh, insurance application, which is found on uh, on Google Android uh, right now. Uh, you can actually be able to, to go on Google Android. I don't know if you can see this. And you are able to see this uh, application. We call it See It Grow. The application uh, has been able to be, is able now to cover maize, sorghum, and green grams uh, in seven counties in Kenya. Uh, we have also been able to implement uh, 
crop specific advisories to our target farmers in this application. Uh, that is the first achievement. The second achievement is that we have been able to train and capacitate 20, 27,400 farmers uh, across uh, these seven counties. Uh, we use uh, a mixture of a high touch model, uh, what we call the champion farmers. These are basically an agent based system. These are farmers in the villages, in the villages who around them, there are 150 farmers. Uh, so this, we have been able to do this. Uh, the key results from this training and capacity uh, is that we've been able to have 60% of the farmers being women. And out of these 60% women farmers, only 25% of them have access to smartphones compared to 30% of the men farmers in the program who actually have smartphones. Uh, this is a key indicator for us because it means that um, uh, we need to provide more access to smartphones for our project or our intervention to really go ahead. Uh, and thus, uh, we are implementing a system whereby we want to increase the number of champion farmers, this agent-based model, from uh, the current 51% women champion farmers to 60% uh, women champion farmers. Uh, so with those good results, what happened is that COVID-19 happened and, uh, you know, everything went into, into all these things that uh, we have at the moment. Uh, the key uh, uh, impact to the project is the, the mobility restrictions meaning that project staff and also the champion farmers cannot reach out to their farmers directly. Uh, the second thing is that uh, we, we, we foresee or we, we actually contemplate, we see that uh, there's going to be disruption in the value chain. Uh, this include uh, lack to access of labor, lack to access of inputs and markets to our target farmers. And this has big implications because then with no product uh, production activity taking place, uh, we will not be able to to carry out and study these uh, impacts. So these are uh, these interventions that you want to do. Uh, the adjustments we've made based on that is that first of all we have uh, approached uh, our training remotely. So with uh, the champion farmers, we've now concentrated on using WhatsApp groups. We have a lot of WhatsApp groups. I think we have more than uh, 10 WhatsApp groups with these champion farmers in them where we are doing the training uh, online uh, using the groups uh, through, uh, through phone calls and uh, through other means. Uh, but we've also developed um, uh, uh, digital tools for, for the training because the application itself is, is digital based. So we are able to do that. Uh, the second adjustment and uh, the second thing that we are looking at is to try to to assess the impact of COVID-19 on the value chain disruption. Uh, we already think and uh, uh, con contemplate that uh, there's going to be a disruption in terms uh, in terms of access to inputs uh, uh, and uh, access to markets. So we want to harness our our current existing partnerships to provide that. But we're also looking at directly participating in social protection or welfare of our farmers by either providing some tele, tele doctor uh, solutions around them. Uh, the key lessons is that actually when we harness remote uh, tools and digital uh, tools, we are able to actually continue with these interventions. We think that uh, this is a, a lesson for us and for other projects to really uh, take up this. Uh, finally, I would like to thank uh, IDRC and the SCIR team for giving us this opportunity to do this project. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Amos. Uh, thank you for that presentation. We now, uh, last but not least, <clears throat> excuse me, we shall hear from uh, Dr. Samira Mohammed. Uh, Samira is a senior scientist at ISIPE and project leader of uh, the Alien Invasive Fruit Flies project. Over to you, Samira. Hello, everybody. I'm, I will be presenting on behalf of the team implementing um, environmentally management of fruit fly in southern Africa, specifically Zambia, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Mozambique. Just to put it in context, mango is an important food and cash crop in sub Saharan Africa with high potential of contributing to the livelihood of small uh, uh, mango growers as well as other stockholders along, along the value chain, especially women, are used. However, do you know that fruit fly, as much as are tiny, and some of them are very beautiful insects, they cause massive uh, losses uh, to mango and other fruits. 
and uh, uh, however, even the farmers themselves, they don't know the, this fact. And this is what we established from our study, which I have just undertaken. So very few farmer, I, I mean farmer, they think um, mango contribute very minimally to their annual income. And this basically because of the losses due to fruit fly. Not only that, less than 30 percent they are willing to uh, to buy the um, uh, management tool for management of fruit fly. And this again uh, related to the lack of knowledge of their fruit fly and the, the their management. And this necessitates the capacity the capacity building. And this is exactly what we did. So uh, we have so far we have trained over 1,000 mango grower of which Mm, uh, six in ten were females, and we are very keen to um, on uh, uh, women empowerment. On top of that, we have trained over 50 extension officers. Again, um, more, ha more more than half of them are female, and this is quite important, not only for empowering the female extension officer, but uh, but again because of sustainability of the project and female growers. They feel more comfortable interacting with female extension officers. However, it is uh, there are of course um, some aspect we could not do because of COVID-19. We would like to do training in Mozambique and uh, Malawi, and because of COVID-19, this for now we have not undertaken. Again, related to COVID-19, nobody can deny that COVID-19 impacted in on in, in all aspects of uh, on all facets of life. In relation to our project, the farmers, they, they could not access, because of the restrictions, they could not access market uh, to sell their produce. And again, uh, with our intervention, we expect that the, uh, the production of fruit will be quite high. So there will be a lot of both harvest losses if they, if they are not able to sell. So we could not sit back and watch things just unfold. So we have to come with innovation to address these uh, challenges. And uh, we, so we were proposing, we help the farmer, we train the farmers on the um, uh, both harvest uh, processing, specifically fruit and vegetable drying using indigenous knowledge. But also we would like to integrate them with the existing structure um, with uh, other stakeholders who, who are involved in mango processing uh, uh, and marketing, packaging and marketing. And uh, definitely we have learned uh, several lessons, but key lessons that we have learned is, um, is uh, you have to have a contingency plan, uh, such like a stockpiling of the material required for the project implementation. And uh, I think this is a good lesson, and we have to take a note of this thing. And with that, I would like to thank IDRC, ICR, and RAN Media for the very uh, good training. Thanks so much. Thank you, Samira. And thank you, every one of you, our presenters this afternoon. Uh, after the We have heard uh, from the five presenters. And so let's open it up for questions now. As we had talked about it earlier, you can raise your hand before, and then we, we, we can also have questions through the, the chat box. Anyone to start us off? I'll invite Marcy in case she has any questions from the chat box. But in the meantime, I can see, did I see a hand? Professor Wambalaba, you have your hand on. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to listen to these uh, wonderful presentations and also to uh, ask a question. I wanted to ask a question for Mario uh, Chilumba. Uh, he mentioned that uh, in one of the um, uh, information gathering, they realized that uh, market access is, uh, was a major uh, challenge. And I just wanted to know uh, how they approach the process of actually uh, enabling the entrepreneurs to access market, because uh, it's one of those uh, areas 
uh, that we hear from most of our entrepreneurs uh, that if they could just access market, um, then uh, everything will be fine. So I would want to learn a little bit more about that. Thank you. Mario, that question is for you, Mario. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for your question. Um, well, uh, regarding the market, yes, this is really a bottleneck um, uh, from the, the size of our farmers. Uh, it's something that uh, we could find in all the sites. And uh, definitely, if we sort out the market issues, of course, we'll be sorting out also this big issue that they do have. What is our strategy? At the beginning uh, on the design of our project, actually we intended to use um, the agricultural innovation platforms uh, so that we could uh, bring uh, closer to the farmers, uh, you know, potential uh, buyers and traders, you know, that then could uh, connect to each other. And then uh, by, by, by doing this, having the farmers easily uh, identifying uh, where they could put their products and also on the uh, buyer side getting to know who has for instance a specific product and of which quality that we would be looking for uh, this is an approach that actually we have been using and in another project which we could see that actually it brings really positive results uh, at least uh, 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 to have the farmers uh, 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 easily connecting or managing to put their products into the market. At this point of COVID-19 situation, uh, we changed a little bit the strategy there uh, because now we are focusing on creating this um, digital platform. What do we want to do there? Uh, we have already started to map uh, these uh, potential buyers who are there, where they are, and what are they looking for uh, in one side. And on the other side, we also have want to have the farmers uh, 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 communicating with these buyers instead of saying, okay, I have this product or I'll have this product in this much time. If you're interested, then you can contact. So then we want to have them like communicating to each other at a real time. So. These are the kind of strategies that we are considering at the moment to the project. Thank you, Mario. Um, we have a question from Jemima from, for the Fruit Fly project. So Samira, um, what are some of the gender dimensions you are seeing in the mango value chain around ownership, decisions, sales and income management, and how are these affected by the pandemic? Samira. Uh, thanks so much, Jemima, for the very valid question. I will refer this uh, question to our uh, social economy uh, gender specialist, Dr. Monica Fisher, who is also uh, in the team. Monica? Yes, I'm here. Thank you um, for that question. Um, so unfortunately, we're not currently able to answer this question. It's a very good one. However, very soon we'll be able to answer this question because we have recently conducted gender disaggregated interviews at the, both the Malawi and the Zimbabwe sites. And we collected the, that sort of information on ownership, um, uh, sales, income, and so forth using the, in this case, we used um, the AWEA tool rather than the ProWaya in order to keep the interviews to a reasonable amount of time. So sorry to not be able to give you a good answer immediately, but um, I'd say within a month we'll have some answers on that question. Thank you. Okay. Um, to Eka, Amos, a uh, question for you. So this is a very, your project is very digitized. So could you tell us a little bit more about the participation of youth in the project? Yes, this is interesting. So um, one of the things that we noticed from uh, the first, um, we, we do some kind of pre baseline at the beginning of each season is that uh, most of the farmers still are, 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 are above uh, 45 years. Most of the farmers in Kenya, we have about, I think, 45% um, above 45 years. Um, while the youth are less than 20% in the targeted areas. 
what we notice in our in the project is that um, um, when we go to uh, to households where we we want to sign up a farmer, um, most of these older generation uh, farmers do not have probably a smartphone. They probably have a a feature phone. Uh, but you will find that a person in the in the household, either the son or the daughter or, or a younger person has access to that. And this has really enabled us to do the project because then the, the, the young person participates in the in the taking of the photos using the applications uh, to, 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 to do this. So we are seeing uh, in a small way contribution of young people to, towards the project by uh, by availing what they have been using for other things to, to, to contribute to the agriculture itself. The most interesting uh, thing we found out in the in the first uh, in the first uh, period that is the uh, last year was also around just how to use digital tools and um, a lot of uh, the older farmers were very scared of using the smartphone. Uh, a lot of them didn't have smartphones. Uh, uh, what we did is just to encourage them and to show how how they use uh, how they use them. And then we saw a lot of them actually going out to buy their own smartphones, uh, and that is one of the interesting things. But uh, our intention is to really also push uh, for more young people to directly contribute to 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 to, the, to agriculture through the project. Okay. Um, the next question goes back to you, Mario, and this is in regards to inputs. And the question is, what is the impact of providing those inputs on the budget of the project? And uh, where are you going to purchase those inputs uh, or do you have them stockpiled for you to provide them to the farmers? Mario, I see Andre, so I don't know who's taking the yes, question. Yes, um, yeah. I'll, be taking, I'll be taking on this question. And thanks, Laura, for you know putting this question for us. Well, um, I'll start by the first part where you are asking about the impact of this activity on the budget. So we'll definitely have to uh, do some reallocation from the budget that we already have. And since we have reduced the budget, uh, which was uh, meant for research and moving to the fields and working closely with the farmers, so we think this budget can be the one big that is reallocated to you know help farmers with the inputs. And from uh, the assessment that we have carried out with the input provision with the input providers. Um, we, we found out that the inputs are still there. So, you know, uh, the input providers, they have the inputs, and it's just a matter of farmers not being able to pay for those inputs. So that's why we will um, help them in accessing those inputs. And uh, it's not in your questions, but I think it's important to uh, add here. What we will do also is to make sure that these inputs are accounted for when we provide to the farmer. So they know the real cost for those inputs and that uh, uh, cost is is to be paid back uh, um, after they harvest and, and they sell the production. And when they pay back, they pay back to the, uh, um, to the association itself. And that money is the one that they can um, use, you know, uh, in future cases where someone, uh, for instance, in, in short, of cash or and it, you know wants to invest in their home in their in their plot so then uh, they can use uh as a, some kind of uh, credit and saving scheme and this will continue on uh, um, in a long time you know during the, the uh, working of the of the farmer uh, i also like to highlight that we work in two provinces in gaza and maniga and there we have uh, local partners um uh, who are, are based there and they can um, easily move to the scheme so we don't have to travel from Maputo to those two provinces. And in this way, we'll be addressing this issue of uh, limitations related to movement uh, because of the COVID situation. So I, I think I, I will uh, end my intervention there. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. So the next question is to Dorothy. Dorothy, in what form is this Nutrifish product and what is the amount of the product that is giving 30 to 50 percent of the five nutrients? Uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, the product is a maize flour uh, that is enriched with fish. Uh, it is a flour that is used for making a commonly consumed dish in East Africa, posho or ugali in Swahili. So it is a stew, uh, the flour is used for making 
making a stiff porridge that is used as a meal and can be eaten with a soul. Uh, so um, the quantity uh, from our previous work, we know that uh, a mother with probably two kids at home will buy about 200 to 250 grams of flour for lunch. So the serving portion that we are talking about is that 200 grams of the flour uh, that uh, will provide, uh, um, you know, uh, about 53 percent of the zinc requirement, uh, about and, and about 30 uh, to 28 to 30 percent of the rest of the nutrients. So on average, between 30 to 60 percent of the nutrients. So it is 200 grams of the flour that is prepared into a meal. Uh, that is eaten with a sauce. Excellent, thank you. The next question is for Amos um, Eka. Do you have standards for taking the pictures and who is going to manage the data to take the decision, to make the decision? Thank you, Tai. So one of the things that we've done is to create protocols on uh, how to actually make this an insurance project, uh, product. And this involves working with different partners. Uh, we actually have a very specific uh, board, which is composed of uh, insurance, um, uh, the crop inspectors uh, from insurance companies. Uh, it also co uh, consists of uh, people from CALRO, that is the, the Kenya Agricultural and Livestock uh, Research Organization. So these are agronomists. Uh, we also have uh, staff members from our, our, our staff, uh, from our company. We also have partners from uh, seed companies who sit together. Uh, and actually tomorrow we are having a, a, a training on how to accept and how to look at the photos and quantify that. So there's a whole protocol around how to detect uh, damage on crops based on these photos. Uh, however, one, one of the key things that I'm actually contributing to the project is actually to automate uh, the whole process using machine learning, uh, working closely with um, some, some of the great uh, professors in, in the field of automation. Uh, so we are working on uh, machine learning algorithms to already uh, detect, uh, automatically detect these uh, losses from the photos that are being submitted. Trust me, in a, in, in a week, we get more than uh, 10,000 photos from uh, these farmers. So we need to automate it uh, faster. At this, at the, currently, we have a, a panel which sits uh, and uh, looks at the images and then uh, decides if there's a loss or not. Okay. Um, we have three more questions. So I'll take Dr. Toure's question. And this goes to Dr. Sime uh, from Ethiopia, Sogam, Ethiopia. What is the most important shift, in your view, in the COVID context for researchers supporting knowledge for enhanced smallholder production of sorghum in Ethiopia? The most important shift for researchers. In term, okay. Uh, in our case, maybe so far, uh, to give you the background, still we are not at the planting stage. The planting or the, the main main activities will start in June, and uh, so far what we are trying to do is we are following the guidelines given by the health minister, and uh, we try to uh, do things in a safe way as per the guidelines given by uh, the Ministry of Health. Otherwise, what we think is we, we will see more impacts and the desired changes or modifications required while we are actually executing the trials on the field. Planting is coming uh, in the June. Uh, so at this time, we are at the preparation of uh, the input. We are distributing the input. We are trying to guide uh, extension officers, we are trying to develop guidelines and distribute them to the extension office uh, workers. So actually we didn't uh, face challenge in implementing the trials. What we faced is we faced in uh, ex challenge in executing training, uh, conducting a baseline service and the value chain analysis. So what we need to do is just to compensate those activities in the uh, future when the uh, lockdown is lifted off. Can I add 
can add a few points on this question? Thank you. Uh, well, just um, in fact, COVID-19 is uh, a serious issue just for us. Uh, and what we have learned is just so far we have been uh, designing training just for a number of farmers and uh, experts just uh, through presentation. Now, what we have discussed last time is just to have or to create a media for for farmers and for development agents to access like videos and audios so that they can have access about the production package and or any information and without any contact uh, we can share all that information and farmers can get the information to use for their farmers farming practice so just it's a good lesson for us and hopefully we are now, now trying to think of design different mechanisms just to share or to transfer knowledge to the farmers. It's one of the one is video and audios. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go to Jemima's question and this goes to both uh, the pre-cooked beans team and the NutriFish team. So Dorothy and Grace, please uh, take this question. You're both working on developing flour. Uh, so, are you comparing notes, and uh, what do you think your points of convergence would be, Dorothy? Uh, uh, thank you, Jamaima, for the oh. question. Jackson is going to answer. Okay. Yeah. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Jackson Fitri, uh, PI Nutrifish Project. Thank you, Jamaima, for the question. And uh, yes, the two projects are comparing notes. In fact, we've worked closely with the Grace even beyond uh, the, the, the products themselves. Uh, the point of convergence is, I think, uh, in terms of the uh, groups we are targeting, we are targeting vulnerable groups, looking to improve uh, nutrition among women and uh, children. So we work closely together. Maybe I could invite Grace to add something. Thank you. Grace? Okay, so I think we, like um, uh, Jackson has said, we really work together and since we are targeting the same groups, uh, we are all targeting the vulnerable groups, women and then the children, basically people at the base of the pyramid. So I think the two projects are really working in harmony. Okay, and you'll be comparing notes at the end of it? Yes, we shall. Okay. Exactly. So we shall finish with uh, Renault's uh, no, uh, question, and this goes to all the teams. Uh, so all nine teams. What is the most useful thing you heard from other projects in terms of uh, reaction to the current context that may influence how you think about your own project and not just for today, but going forward? We start with Mario. Anything uh, in particular that you can pick out? Well, um, actually, we we sort of exchanged some idea on that, and uh, we realized that one key aspect that we could learn from the others is this need of um, having more support from electronic-based platforms uh, to the target groups. Either they could be farmers or you know whoever that is targeting in the project, but uh, we think that one key aspect that should be looking at and uh, that the teams should take into account is the gender digital div divide. What we mean there is, um, if you remember, uh, empowering women is essential also in our project, and uh, with all these technologies uh, introduced either through uh, SMS is or WhatsApp, or whatever platform, we may get into a situation whereby the women, they do not have the same access to this platform as men. So it is something that we need to keep a close eye on to make sure that whatever messages that we are trying, you know, to channelize to these target groups uh, really gets to in an equal manner to men and women. Uh, thank you. What we're going to do is, if I could ask you to give us 
um, that the answer to that question in the chat box so that we shall have um, a variety of teams uh, letting us know exactly how this has influenced them. Uh, that we shall take that because currently we are um, at the point at which we need to welcome Dr. Toure. Uh, so if you could just put that in the chat box, we are going to pick that up as we go along. So thank you very much. Leah, over to you or Catherine. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy, mm -hmm. and thank you to all of the teams. We totally appreciate that uh, a lot of effort has gone into preparing, you know, for today. So we really thank you. So I now invite Dr. Catherine Tully, uh, IDRC's Regional Director of Eastern and Southern Africa, to give some closing remarks. Thanks uh, so much, Leah. Thanks, everyone. First of all, um, we have Andrew Campbell in the room. He didn't know that he would be able to to make it. Is he still uh, in the room? Andrew, it would be, um, we don't get to see you every day and the teams don't get to see you every day. Before I share a couple of thoughts, it would be great to, to hear from you. We're in a partnership. We'd love to hear from you. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, um, Firstly, thank you to all 50 participants I think we've got uh, and congratulations on this initiative of getting everyone together for a webinar. It's, uh, it's been terrific. So hello and thanks to our IDRC friends in, uh, in Ottawa and Nairobi and, uh, and to ACR colleagues here in Canberra and in Nairobi. Uh, Leah, thank you very much for your work on this. But most of all to our project partners in Africa, it's been great to hear rich detail at a pro, at a, down at a project level. Um, and very impressive uh, responses to COVID-19, uh, to the pandemic and the associated travel restrictions and so on. Uh, so I must admit I've been surprised at how well uh, projects have been able to continue their activities with some in innovative responses. That said, I think the point that Amos just made before about the uh, gender digital divide is a really important one because if we are all going to be using, making much more use of digital tools, uh, we need to make sure that they're equitably shared. Um, it's great to hear about some evidence of impact at scale. Uh, and it's clear that uh, collectively we've got a terrific story to tell. So. I hope that we can promote it uh, very widely and, and uh, look forward to us doing that. So thank you very much, everybody, and very well done. Keep up the great work. Thanks uh, so much, Andrew. And I would just uh, join Andrew Campbell's voice in saying that um, I've learned a lot. I've been impressed um, by the work of the, the researchers, by the synergies within your teams, but also across the teams. I also appreciate the question from Renault about what uh, each person uh, or each team learned through today's web webinar that could impact your work going forward because we now have this uh, platform for sharing across uh, the different the work of the different teams. And I would just like to close in recognizing the importance of partnership. IDRC and the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research are in partnership. We are sister organisations where we both care deeply about uh, building southern based research systems and contributing to food security and nutrition in East Africa. We are also in partnership with all of you um, conducting your research and adapting your research at this important time and we appreciate that you're in partnership with each other as well. It's the only way we will get through something as big as COVID by uh, working in a spirit of solidarity and partnership. So it is hard to leave each other after sharing like this. So my colleagues know that I sometimes propose a checkout exercise. So Renault already gave you one exercise, and if you don't type your answers about what you've um, learned from today, you can always send that to Adida and to Mercy by email because they'll be compiling a report and including that in their report. But what I would like to do is just ask you for a moment to think about food futures, because this is also an area 
where ACIR and IDRC are collaborating. Maybe you'll close maybe you'll keep your eyes open but just envision for a moment what the future of farms is going to be what's the future of farming going to be what's the future of food going to be for you what does that look like what are the relationships what's different from what we might know today And then with that in your mind, uh, on your way out of this space that we've shared for two hours, I invite you to just type that into the chat box, just a line, just a line to give us some insight into your vision of food, food future. And with that, maybe we can um, all take our microphones off or activate our microphones and give a big round of applause to everyone who prepared and participated in this session. Bravo, everybody. Let us see a line about your future uh, as you check out. Have a wonderful day.